You're listening to First Contact, Stories of the Call Center, a podcast brought to you by Noble Biz, your all-in-one contact center solution. Every month, our host, Christian Montes, talks to tech leaders and entrepreneurs who found their way into the contact center industry. Welcome back to First Contact, Stories of the Call Center. This month, we're really excited to bring you something fresh, something different and innovative uh, than we've done in the last two seasons. So uh, we brought on the co-founder of Balto, a software as a service provider that does real-time guidance for contact centers. Now, we're obviously going to talk about what that means, but we're super excited to have Mark Bernstein on the call, who's had a reputation really pioneering this space and really allowing this to come out into the forefront. So Mark, welcome to the show. Super excited to have you on. Christian, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we'd love to do on this show is tell people your story. Instead of just getting into that, what am I doing today, which we'll definitely get to, we really want to understand how did you get here? What were you doing in your past life, right? What were you doing for other jobs, careers? How did you even get to the point of saying, hey, this company should be created. I should go off and build a company. And obviously you're young, right? You're younger than a lot of the people that we brought on. And so it's exciting to see a completely different perspective. So teach, show, share our audience where your beginnings came from and how you even got to Balto. Yeah, you got it. So uh, I'm 28, which means that uh, I went into the workforce, um, noticed a problem, And then said, you know, I think uh, solving this problem could impact millions and millions of people. Um, So I started before Balto. I was in uh, in B2B SaaS um, at a company called TopOps uh, in St. Louis. And uh, the guys who founded TopOps had founded these two other unicorn companies or very close to unicorns, uh, Host Analytics, um, you know, billion dollar company or so, and Gainsight also. A lot of people are familiar with Gainsight. Yep. And when I was at Top Ops in B2B sales, I had this experience where I would go into uh, the CEO's office for sales coaching because he was the sales manager. We were like 25 or 30 people. You got to do it both. And he'd pull up the call recording and give me a bunch of really good advice. All the stuff that you know you, you tell salespeople now, don't talk too much. Make sure you ask good discovery questions. If somebody has an objection, here's how you handle it. If somebody wants, uh, you know, uh, make sure you qualify. Don't forget to qualify because it'll bite you later. All that kind of stuff. And I would leave his office feeling fantastic. Like, whoa, I just learned so much. That was incredible. And then the inspiration for the company is I then had an experience I realized – Everybody in sales and customer services had where you leave your manager's office for coaching, you then get to the next call, you finish your call and you hang up the phone and then you say to yourself, I freaking blew that. I knew what I was supposed to do. I was coached on that 15 minutes ago, but I didn't do it. And the insight was that there is a gap between knowledge of what you should do on a call about what the best thing is to do on a call and doing it in the moment that you need to do it live while you're talking with the customer. And you know, if it's hard enough for one person to get that right 15 minutes after a coaching session, now scale it. What environment has hundreds or thousands of people that need to get this right on every single customer interaction? It's the contact center. It is the lifeline that companies have between their business operations and their customers, and the conversation is the atomic unit of that business. Well, that's a great story. And obviously, when you look at it from the perspective of you found a, a challenge and then you found a need and a place to be able to make it um, come to fruition, let's kind of stop for a second and talk about, though, when you talk about Balto real time guidance, right? And using AI. Um, obviously you talk about the need, right? And you talk about that situation, but now let's kind of dive in a little bit deeper. So what is it that Balto does and how does that actually fulfill this mission that you're trying to achieve? Yeah. So I'll tell you how the you know idea uh, got, got started. And that was, I was sitting there on a call talking too much and I was thinking, man, how helpful would it be if someone just gave me a tap on the shoulder and said, Hey Mark, you're doing it again. And I was like, could we automate that? Is there some way I could have an automated shoulder tap? Um, 
And you know that kind of led down a trail where we said, what if you could have an AI that did real-time conversation intelligence, analyzed everything the customer was saying as the customer was saying it, everything the agent was saying as the agent was saying it, and in real time gave the agent recommendations on their computer screen about how they can be as effective as possible. So that's what we built. Uh, we call it real-time guidance, and it's analyzing the conversations, guiding agents in those make-or-break moments, making sure they're asking for the sale if it's a sales use case, making sure they're understanding the customer frustration if it's a customer service or retention use case, making sure that they're doing the right compliance stuff. They don't forget to give the disclosures and disclaimers that they have to give uh, if it's a compliance use case. So that that's fundamentally what we built with real-time guidance, and we're integrated with over 40 different CCAS uh, systems. So if you're on 5.9 or Nice and Contact or Ring Central or 8x8, we got an integration as long as you're using a cloud-based phone system, not like a hard phone or a physical landline. Understood. So it's interesting that we talk about this technology because just last season, we were speaking with Nancy Monroe about speech analytics and call center training. And then we were talking about, hey, you know, how do we use and leverage AI to provide real time guidance to agents? And obviously we're sitting here now, we're talking to you about real time guidance, right? So how does it feel to go from an idea, then all of a sudden now be fully productized and implemented in, like you said, all these different platforms, this concept of real time guidance leveraged by AI? Yeah. So I'll, I'll speak to the actual emotion for a second. Um, mixed emotions. And the reason is, you know, we're proud. We're proud that, you know, we invented this technology. We came up with it. We brought it to market. We've built a base of over a hundred, you know, happy, delighted customers. You know, we've analyzed over 60 million calls, um, and delivered 165 million real-time recommendations. We're proud that we've been able to do this. Um, at the same time, you know, now we're starting to see that the market is catching on and everyone is talking about real-time guidance. Analysts are talking about it. CCAS companies are talking about it. Buyers are talking about it. And a piece of us is saying, hey, folks, welcome to the party. <laughs> it's about time. So, uh, so th there's, there's those, those dual feelings, but we, we are really excited that we're able to bring this technology to the market from a position of strength. Um, and at the same time, you know, totally patient and understanding that sometimes it takes a few years for this sort of technology to warm up and, and we get that. And we're just really grateful that, uh, folks have been spending the time with us and looking at what we've built and comparing it to other options out there. And, uh, you know, have not said lightly that man, Balta really is the, the number one real time guidance platform. And that's just, uh, you know, we've earned that and, and we, we earned it through blood, sweat and tears and. Um, we're just, we're really proud of that distinction as well. Well, definitely something to be proud of. And obviously anytime you have a bleeding edge idea or concept that can materialize and it starts helping produce better outcomes and to, uh, you know, improve not only on the customer experience and journey, but also agents feeling that they can actually improve in their productivity, get better outcomes. And then obviously for the business, being able to impact those KPIs that help them measure success for their business. So let's kind of pivot a little bit away from that piece slightly, but just talk a little bit about emotional analytics. Is it embedded into your product? And if not, is that something that you're interested in pursuing? And then kind of let's talk about that from the potential of, have you seen any interest in that as an add on to this? It, it is. Uh, so we do have a sentiment analysis in the product. Um, and we specifically are doing sentiment analysis through understanding the conversation. So it's not a uh, tonal analysis. It's understanding, you know, what folks are actually saying on the calls. That's an important distinction. So I think that, uh, and we have heard, by the way, a lot of interest in sentiment analysis for years. So what you kind of have to ask, the question you have to ask is once you have that sentiment analysis, then what? What's the next thing that your company does? How do you turn um, this customer is mad into something useful? So uh, you know we have uh, made our philosophy since day one uh, that real-time guidance is fundamentally about having a real-time insight uh, in the moment that something that you can know something, the moment you can know something that that insight poof being generated, but it doesn't matter unless there's also real-time delivery. 
you have to send that insight somewhere useful right there in the moment too where it can make a big impact. So if you uh, are looking for you know, a technology that is analyzing all your sentiment uh, so you know, folks can sit back and kind of click through reports and, you know, and look at sentiment, uh, that's not really what we're built for. You know, we have it. You can find the report in there, but that's not like what you're going to get out of the experience with Balto. Uh, what you're going to get experience with Balto is uh, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> right now, Christian's on a call and uh, the customer is super frustrated. That would Click never this happen. button. <laughs> yeah. No, never. You never get a frustrated customer. All the happy people, they route to you. Um, well, uh, you know, right there in the moment. Uh, you can uh, have the the agent and the manager jump in and help uh, win that customer over and keep a happy customer and prevent a frustrated customer. That connection of the insight and the delivery is what we're all about, and that's how Balto will use sentiment analysis. That's awesome. So we've talked about a little bit peripherally about AI, but on the show, we've talked about it a lot, right? We've brought a lot of experts and we've discussed a lot of opinions and perspectives of how AI is going to impact the industry. Now, I think we've kind of gotten to the point where we don't feel collectively that it's going to entirely replace agents, period, right? That they're somehow magically a flip of switch and they disappear. Um, but for those that are interested in understanding other people's perspectives, obviously they can go reach out and look at, through our past episodes. But with that in mind, you know, you believe and you've said the next wave of AI will support and augment abilities versus replacing humans. Um, how do you see that happening exactly? Yeah. So um, AI will certainly do both. It's going to replace and it's going to augment. And the question is, you know, in this next era, the next one to two decades, where is the biggest lever? Is the biggest lever replacing or is the biggest lever augmenting? And I think that when you're replacing people, um, but usually uh, you're replacing them um, with something that is a little bit lower quality. Um, and you know, you can think about you know a uh, one of those automated kiosks where you're ordering from an automated kiosk, like a, at a fast food restaurant. And in the beginning, those things were terrible. Like, oh my God, you you were like, oh, this is like, I have to click through 10 different screens. And the fact that it looks cool, you kind of like it the first time, you're like, oh, geez, get me a real you know person I can talk to. But over time, it got better and better and better. Um, and you know that replacement is now something that if we see an automated kiosk, we're usually like, fine, that's totally cool. Um, but the problem with replacing is that there is a limit to what you're able to get from a return perspective as a business. Because the, the, all you can get is the cost of the thing that you were replacing. So if you're a contact center, all you can get is the cost uh, of you know, the agents you're replacing or the quality assurance you're, you're replacing. Whereas if you're augmenting, your upside is potentially unlimited. Because your upside is, you know, how can you augment agents to do two times as much, three times as much, four times as much, and that directly touches top line and touches your revenue. So um, the other thing I'll say about augmenting and replacing is that um, augmenting is easier because there's a human in the loop. So the problem with replacing is that there's a machine 100% by itself doing every function. And just like people, machines make mistakes sometimes. Um, especially with AI where it's contextual and, you know, there's new challenges and not every person's the same, it's going to make mistakes. So the, then when you have a person, you almost have a backup. You have the machine making a recommendation and the person uh, checking and saying, yes, that is, that is right. We like that. And you, using my human brain and uh, all that, I'm going to say that, that I like this recommendation. Or you could review it, view it as the reverse of the uh, person uh, you know, being in charge and the machine being the backup. Uh, but there's two systems there to make sure that you don't uh, give a bad uh, outcome. So I think that you know, as AI develops, we're going to need both systems working together um, for the next few decades. Uh, and then, of course, if you go out, you know, centuries, and you know, you're saying, well, what will the world look like in a thousand years? Uh, my guess is a, a lot more on the replacement side. Um, but we're not there yet. And while we're in this era, and we're uh, you know trying to figure out how we can build. Uh, you know, amazing lives for, you know, different folks in the contact center and their families. Uh, the way to do that is to help them be better at their job and bring better business results to their businesses. 
Yeah, I totally agree with a lot of what you said. And I think some of the applications we've seen some of these things is where things that can be automated, where you can do more with less, you could also find ways where they're more transactional in nature, where you don't really need to have a conversation to get, you know, an account number or to see if a delivery is done or get something automated, make a payment, things like that. But then you also see that you're elevating the agents, the representatives, collectors, whoever you have within your organization to another level where they're able to provide even a higher, uh, better experience with people, basically. So you're able to do more, faster, better, and you're able to get them to a much more um, higher performance than they would have otherwise, right? And you're able to do it yep. on a larger scale. So it's interesting that we talk about that because one of the things that you know you proposed is you know calling something the age of anti-script, right? And we want to kind of start there for a little bit and understand what do you mean by the fact that, you know, we're at the age of the anti-script, because we understand there's a lot of people that their discussions are scripted. Totally. So um, the uh, anti-script doesn't mean that you should be winging it on every call. You shouldn't. You absolutely shouldn't. Um, what anti-script means is think about a physical paper script. And you have the you know, agent who's reading it off word for word and says, hello, Christian, my name is Mark. How are you doing today? Wait for a customer response. Excellent. I wanted to let you know about a new offer that we have for your area. Ugh. <laughs> like customers have never been more repulsed by that sort of interaction. Right, and we've learned. We've learned through robocalls. We've learned through te decades of telemarketing um, that those sort of interactions aren't good, and that we won't have our needs met, or you know, have a new product or a new service or a good experience if the person's communicating that way. It's pattern recognition. Well, what's interesting about but that, what if? But, but what's interesting yeah. about that? What's funny is you've now made a human sound robotic. <laughs> yeah. The point of it is, is you're supposed to be a human. And yet you're not using technology per se as a robot replacement, but you're making humans no longer sound human. So it's just ironic that that's kind of the, the way it's done when you think about it from that perspective. It, you're so right. You're taking the most powerful part of the human out of the human. Uh, Christian, think about like a presentation that you might have given. Um, and chances are that when you were preparing for the presentation, uh, you probably didn't r r memorize what you were going to say word for word. You probably had bullet points. You probably had basic talking points. So, okay, when I get to this slide, here's the basic things I'm going to say. When I get to this slide, here's the basic things I'm going to say. Um, so let's put that into the conversation. Let's not have you have to memorize something word for word. Let's give agents talking points. Let's give them guideposts. Let's give them basic direction of here's the key things that you got to hit. Here's some of the ways that you should respond to customers. Choose the right option. Do what you think is best. And here's a couple of ways to do that. That's the how we're going to move from a script, you know. Versus, you know, if you say I have a budget objection, I I can't pay for this right now, um, you know. Versus, Christian, I totally understand. Let's see if we can find an option works with your budget. Now, uh, I must let you know that a lot of customers first say that, and they are surprised to learn that it's less expensive than they had previously thought. Like that's that level of scripting, like isn't going to cut it. It's not going to leave good results, but you having a, a couple of tried and true options and being able to uh, respond in the way with your own voice, the way that you want to respond while still sticking to the, the heart of the subject matter, that is what is going to replace the script. And that's what everyone wants in a conversation naturally. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you have the idea of, you know, via voice when you have your supervisor and they can whisper, right? They can listen to your call. And they can give you real-time guidance in that sense behind the scenes, but you're attaching an expensive resource, a human being to every call. And the reality is, is you're not going to have a supervisor for every agent that has an issue at all times, right? And maybe you will, maybe you won't, but sometimes you won't even know there's an issue until after there's that initiation or something pulls that up and pulls somebody in. So being able to scale that is obviously important. Um, the next topic that I wanted to cover is something that I think people, when they think of this technology, they also talk about, but they may not look at it the same way. So we talk about having better post-call analysis, right? That way you can increase the conversations, improve the relationship. But can you tell us, what do you think the future of post-call analytics is going to be? And how does your company fit into that? Yeah, so I think it really depends on 
what kind of user you have. Because there is some portion of users who want to do post-call analysis. They want to do big batch analyses where they analyze a million calls at once and go develop models. And there are some teams that are really good at that. Uh, two problems. One is when you do that, um, how do you, um, you know, your, your lead time is super long because you're doing this big analysis and you're, you're spending usually months, no joke, months putting together a model. So it takes a long time to go from analysis to result. And then once you do it, where does that model go? You usually hand it to a sales leader, customer service leader, and they say, okay, thanks. <laughs> but how do you actually get that model applied at scale across all of your sales and customer service people across your entire contact center? So those are, are two bottlenecks or challenges with post-call analysis, even though the ability to you know, dig and mine for insights is useful. You can, you can find great stuff there. I think the future on that side is particularly going to be on um, you know, deflection, you know, uh, call deflection, interaction deflection, looking uh, to find uh, you know, different use cases people are calling in with so you can change your IVR, so you can change your chatbot to try to handle some of those cases proactively. I also think um, it could be particularly useful for marketing and product research. Uh, voice of the customer, I think, is something that folks were really excited about two or three years ago, and now the interest is kind of dying down. And I think it's because um, we haven't done a good job of turning the voice of the customer into something useful. So when you look at what the future, I think that's kind of what the past of post-call analysis looks like and ways you can use that post-call in a very you know, still useful way and get a good ROI from it. But I think if you advance the field and say what's coming forward, I think it's post-call analysis where it immediately surfaces an insight. So post-call means like the second the call is done, the second that you can have an analysis that makes sense, your technology goes ding, 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 here's an insight. And the insight isn't a graph, it's not a number, it is like you can read it out like a sentence that says, here is something you should know. Now the thing is, uh, for post-call analysis to not get lost and not get stuck and not get bottleneck, what you need to do is you need to have a button that you can push that says, do something with this insight. <laughs> I don't know what the something is. Balto has a, a bunch of ideas on our end, but is there some way that when you see the insight, you're able to hit a button or do an action right away that that makes it that turns it into a result? So on Balto's side, I'll give you the example. Um, you know, we'll you know analyze calls after the fact, and we'll um, you know put put up a recommendation that says this particular question that you're using or this value proposition you're giving or this way you're explaining something is effective 72 percent of the time it's the most effective item push this button and all of your agents will start to see that on the next call or this one isn't effective push this button we'll take it right out of your recommendation so no one is using that question anymore it's the ability to connect the post-call analysis with the actual real-time experience that our people have when they're talking to customers live in their interactions. So a couple of questions around that, and this is kind of a, you know, a, lot of, a little bit off topic, but a little bit aligned with what we're talking about is at a pure curiosity, do you have the ability then to uh, attach the outcome of that call to the analysis? So if that call was a productive call or a positive outcome, the, the way that the call is dispositioned in essence, uh, or otherwise to be able to attach to what was said and used is actually benefiting or gaining the outcomes that you want. Um, how are you tying back the data of things that you want as things said or recommended tied back to the outcome that you're getting from that call? Yep, we do. And it's absolutely critical that we do because the ability to, to as you said, Christian, tie what is being said with did it work or did it not turns balto from a recommendation engine which is the you know the foundation what we built into the most powerful a b testing system on planet earth the marketing world has been a b testing since the sears catalog in the 1800s the sales and customer service world and contact center world isn't a b testing anything except ivr selections but not actually in the conversations 
So because we're able to tie what is being said to the outcome, you can say, you can see when someone you know, says, uh, you know, talks about pricing this way, the, the call uh, leads to a successful sale 72% of the time versus if they talk about it this way, it's 50% of the time versus talk about it this way, it's 10% of the time. So those analytics being presented is critical. And, uh, you know, I won't say too much here, but we do it, uh, one, with analytics and models that, that essentially are looking for what a successful call is, um, which the user, you know, in Balta is the ability to find. And we also um, have an API where people can actually essentially put right into our system their wins and losses. So we're able to see uh, from your own data in your system without a model, what is the source of truth? You know what is resulting in wins and what is not we're able to link into your system to do that totally makes sense and then obviously you know we're seeing a lot of even the people that have joined our webinars and our podcast that are software as a service leaders right you know and we see the SaaS world kind of really getting huge really quickly and obviously you coming in as a SaaS product line and be able to come up rather quickly right versus you know a lot of other companies that didn't come in in that same way how have you seen the SaaS space look and evolving in the contact center space? Yeah, I think uh, this is going to be the golden age of the contact center. I really mean that. And I think that there's two big reasons behind it. Uh, the first is you had all of this retail traffic, this in-person traffic where people were going and visiting stores. And uh, you know, certainly during the pandemic, totally stopped. And you know the traffic got totally cut. So then, where did people go? They went to your website and your digital tools and your social media, and they went to the contact center. And that's why contact center volumes increased over twenty percent uh, last year in twenty twenty. And I think we'll still stay high because a lot of the beh the buying behaviors and the habits shifted, where people realized, man, this is easy. I can just, you know, uh, you know, hit up the social media or I can hit up the contact center or, um, you know, it, it's easier than I thought. So, so that's the, kind of the first trend behind it. It's, it's going to start this, this golden era. And the second is the cloud. Uh, the cloud is not just here. You know, the cloud's here for everybody. Um, it is here. Uh, there's no escaping it at this point. And what does that do? It allows you to have a hybrid workforce where some contact center agents are uh, in office and some may be at home. It allows you to have uh, the ability like Balto to scale out n new scripting, not scripting, but new uh, uh, what used to be scripting with the push of a button. You used to have to print that out and e you know, email it to everyone, print it out, and they'd all put it on their desks. So totally digital now. So that combination, uh, that change of how people buy and of uh, the cloud means that you have this new possibility for this workforce of super agents, of people who are hyper equipped with the best tools that are up to date, you know, to the second. Um, and you're noticing this, uh, you know, pull on the labor economy, where essentially, um, you know, if this is your only lifeline to connect with customers now, you know, the contact center and online, you're going to invest in having awesome contact center agents and you're gonna invest in giving them great experiences. Uh, you're not just gonna to try to you know, shoot people out the door as quickly as possible, because that's your customer. And that's, that's, that's how you connect with them is right there in that moment. So I think that those three things are gonna to lead to um, a real golden age of the contact center and SaaS and cloud and all of, of these different technologies are going to sprout up to support this concept of super agents connecting with your customers where previously they would have been you know, in person or in your physical location. They used to call me the fixer. From the first day I started working in a contact center, I became indispensable. Emotions had the best of me. I was very focused, business driven, and careful in everything I did. I was the know-it-all guy. If there was a problem, I was the person to solve it. If there was a customer experience situation that was going out of hand, I was the one they called. Everything was working smoothly. After a while, I started my own contact center company. I had many agents working for me. Nothing could stand in my way. And then this happened. Technology.
It came like a hurricane. It threw away all my future plans and desires. Social media platforms, AI, integrated software, virtual engagement, cloud management. Ugh. Contact centers were getting more complex each day and things were getting out of hand. Until one day, I was searching for a solution on the internet and there it was, waiting for me, the savior, the answer, the knight in shining armor. Yes, I'm talking about Nobel Biz. I met these experts enabling the Intelligent Contact Center and it changed my life. I could say that they fixed me. Yeah, they fixed the fixer. First, they introduced me to the carrier of carriers, which gave me huge potential for my contact center. With the best quality at the lowest price, it increased my contact rates, saved me money, and gave us the opportunity to get the highest standard in customer experience. But that was not all. They introduced me to amazing productivity tools that gave me and my contact center immense strength and adaptability. And then came the cherry on top, their omni-channel, omni-plus solution, which gave my contact center access to all communication channels in one system. It's so easy to install and it really helped grow my business overnight. Nowadays, no one calls me the fixer anymore. I kind of miss it. Since the number of our clients has doubled, I don't really understand how I became slightly redundant. But on the other hand, I make some amazing coffee. So take your business to higher ground and start using Nobel Biz. Go to nobelbiz.com and see why they're called the promise keepers of the industry. Nah, they should be called the promise fixers, but anyways. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we probably want to just nail that home is the contact center industry as a whole hasn't always adopted technology at the fastest pace and put it in play right away for a variety of reasons. It doesn't mean there aren't certain companies that were leaders in their space, but the idea of adopting all the coolest, latest stuff uh, wasn't necessarily always being done. And I think the pandemic disrupted that mindset for many because they didn't have a choice, right? So the idea of Fear usually is a big driver, knowing what you know. Um, it's the way you've always done things. You understand it, you know how to measure it, you know how to monitor it. So that means you can make sure that you have some sort of uh, way to measure going forward, how you're gonna do and you can forecast properly. You have a lot of unknowns when you implement things that you're not used to or you're not an expert in, right? And those new things break, they don't always work well. We gave the examples earlier of things that uh, didn't necessarily pan out great, you know, those kiosk examples you gave, but eventually they turned out and it works for a lot of things. So with that in mind, you start to look at people that said, I, this isn't even on my roadmap. Now you're tripping over yourself to go, I don't have a choice. I got to figure something out. Now people have made changes and now they're going, wow, it didn't break. Or if it broke, it didn't break for that long. Or we're not, we're not done and out of business. And in some ways you found efficiencies where you didn't find them or work pools of people that you didn't have access to that you can tap into and costs that you may have been able to reduce in other areas. But then there's also other areas where costs have gone up because labor has gotten more expensive in places, finding people is harder to find. So keeping the people you have, making them more productive and giving you better outcomes does mean that you can potentially improve your margins when you're working with a headcount that is stressed with costs on both ends, right? Both uh, the cost of deploying the services and then obviously the revenue you can generate from that outcome. So these types of technologies in the SaaS world seem to really be overlaying with those pain points and people are much more adept to go, yeah, I think maybe it's time we start looking at this stuff versus let's be stuck in the old ways. But that's what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same thing on your end? Yes, absolutely. And if you think about it, Christian, you know, think about how much, uh, businesses used to invest in store design where you know there would be these massive research firms and so much uh, you know data information around when you walk into the store right there on your right is going to be this light shining down on the on the fruit and the fruit is is bright and catches your eye we want to pull you to the right so you see the fruit first and then we're going to make sure that the deli is right there in the back so if you want to try to pick up uh, you know lunch meat for the next day you have to walk back and you have to pass the cereals because you know we know that if you're going to try to get you know a deli meal you might also want to get cereal for the next day like think about how much used to be invested in store design all the way down to the temperature of the store and the music and the tempo of the music 
Like that's that's the level of analysis that was done. What level analysis has been done on helping your contact center agents have excellent conversations with your customers? It's totally nascent. So that's your store now. Your store now is the internet and your store now is the contact center. And if you're not investing um, in the same amount in your store design as you were before, missing out on a crucial opportunity. And I think contact center leaders have seen that. And uh, what they did last year um, you know, in transforming during COVID was heroic. I mean, it really was having millions of people across the world um, changing the way they worked in a heartbeat to keep business operations uh, up and alive, keep as many jobs as they possibly could, add jobs where they could, and uh, deliver vital services and information and products to customers who are stuck in their homes. Um, truly remarkable. And I think the contact center uh, leaders you know, became heroes and they said, you know, wow, we were capable of so much more than we were doing before the pandemic. What if we continue to invest in this functionality? And that's the new mindset of the contact center. I couldn't agree more. And I think I wholeheartedly believe that everyone in the contact center space, among other industries, of course, but absolutely were heroes. And, and with that said, being able to come together Right. I, I felt that there was this synergy between vendors and contact centers and, you know, the outsourcers and the, the enterprises that were all coming together to figure out how do we get through this together. And there was a lot of really great stories of what people did to help each other out, which was amazing. But with that said, when it comes to the COVID pandemic, how did that impact Balto, if at all? Yeah, so um, businesses throughout the pandemic had... You know, we heard a lot in the beginning about the K-shaped recovery. Um, and, you know, for those who may not remember, uh, the idea is the letter K, you know, part uh, some businesses in the economy go way up in one tail of the K and others kind of go way down another tail of the K. Um, Balto was very fortunate that we were on the upper tail. We were on the upper spot. We were one of those businesses that did really, really well um, during COVID. We uh, more than tripled our business, um, in, you know, in 2020, which is incredible. Um, and just you know, very simply, you know, the reason we were able to do that is we delivered for our customers something that they really, really needed. Uh, the first is having excellent conversations at scale. When your contact center volumes go up 20 percent, uh, then uh, you have uh, to you have more to lose if you do a bad job and more to gain if you do a good job. Um, and the second is everybody was remote for a period of time. You know, you used to uh, coach by walking around the floor, you know, looking down, you see that uh, agent looks frustrated or you see that agent um, is having a tough call. You walk over and you give him help, uh, give him or her help, you know, or it used to be that the way as an agent you picked up, you know, what worked and what didn't is you're sitting next to another top agent and you hear something, you're like, whew, that was good. I'm going to try that on my next call. Both of those functions, the coach's function and the agent's function, ripped apart. And there you are alone in your home making the same volume of calls you were making before without that manager support and without the support of your peers. And uh, they, you know, contact centers were looking and saying, how do we give everyone a common understanding of what great conversations look like when everyone is physically uh, and geographically separated? And Balto is that common understanding. Balto has been able to, you know, give agents the coaching they need, give managers uh, real time insight into, you know, who needs help and who doesn't, um, and allow the organization to collect all the great things people are saying. Where if you have a top performer, you know, during COVID and, and they have this, you know, awesome uh, way that, that they position pricing the customers, um, well, y you never knew because <laughs> that person's saying it, you know, to the wall all day. Um, but Nebalto is able to go and pull out what that top performer is saying and then with a push of a button, scale it to everybody. And that functionality became just more important. So, uh, you know, we did uh, phenomenally well during COVID, um, you know, and we were uh, there for our customers to deliver uh, during a really challenging time that uh, a lot of businesses uh, originally were, were really worried about. And then a lot of businesses, um, after just a couple of months, uh, saw the opportunity to invest in their contact center operations, saw the revenue that they could generate um, from doing so, and had you know, similarly really, really excellent years in 2020. 
Absolutely. We saw some of that as well. Some industries suffered, some actually benefited uh, from that K uh, recovery. And at the same time, being able to help both address that, that fuel they needed to keep skyrocketing. And then those that, you know, because when you skyrocket up, like you had said earlier, if you have an issue that, that usually amplifies with scale. So whenever you scale and that problem hasn't been addressed, you're going to have more of that problem. So being able to address that when you scale is important. And then those that need it to help uh, lift that downward trend that their industry took is how do you take care of the customers you have left? How do you take care of the situations you're in? So now you see that shift, you said, where people are pulled away, they're remote. Let's kind of shift to, to QA, right? You know, there's a, a fundamental mindset change around treating QA uh, instead of being the punishment department, right, as has been mentioned. Um, how do you elaborate on that concept and what do you feel about QA being used as the punishment department and how do we change that mindset? Yeah. So if you uh, take kind of a very deep look into like what is the point of QA, like really, um, the there's two kind of unfortunate uh, truths and one good truth. The good truth is that it often is for bonusing and compensating and properly rewarding great agents. That is like absolutely a purpose of QA and we need to do more of that. Well, what are the other, you know, the what's on the dark side? What, what are the, the bad purposes of QA? And one is uh, identifying consistently bad performers in order to root them out. So, you know, that's, that's a big part of, of what QA is about is finding folks who have patterns of underperformance and identifying that and calling it out so they can you know be you know, pulled out of the operation. And the second is finding folks who are normally great performers, but in that moment did something wrong, and that you uh, want to call attention to that. Now, hopefully, you're uh, finding great performers who did something wrong in that moment. Uh, because uh, you want to uh, invest in them and help them be better and go correct whatever the mistake is because mistakes happen. But sometimes, uh, you know, you get, uh, you see an agent uh, finish up a call and then someone yells over, uh, you know, Johnny, uh, QA wants to see you. And then Johnny's like, oh, geez, <laughs> what did I do? And then QA pulls up a call from, you know, two or four weeks ago and says, remember this call? And you say, I, I'm not really. So, um, so how do we invest in that first bit? How do we invest in the bonusing? How do we invest in the rewarding positive behaviors? And how do we, um, you know, limit uh, QA's, um, you know, uh, participation in the latter two? Um, you know, uh, f finding folks who are underperforming and uh, you know punishing folks who are performing well. Well, with finding folks who are underperforming. Um, that's an important thing for a business. It's an important thing for an individual. And if you're underperforming, you should you know find something that you perform well at. So it makes sense to you know not have folks who are persistently struggling with the business in, in a business. Um, it makes sense to not have them there. However, it also makes sense for QA to be part of the solution and say, hey, here's specifically where you're underperforming. Here's how we can help you perform better. And if you hit this standard, this is what it's going to mean for you personally, you professionally, and for the business. So how can QA uh, change their activities um, toward more solution-oriented uh, stuff in that category? And then with the first one of great performers who um, occasionally make mistakes, well, if you're a great performer, how can we just get rid of, of those mistakes? Like a lot of them are just like lapses of judgment or something you forgot. And that's a perfect example of where AI can right there in the moment say, oh, whoop, hey, hello. Uh, looks like you might be uh, going down this route, you should go down that route. But remember, QA is going to dingy on that. So if you can give that uh, top performer instant visibility into um, you know, what kind of score they're going to get and how they're going to be evaluated, often they can uh, change those behaviors and root out those problems. Um, and imagine if you could even do it for QA in real time or do it for the manager in real time. And uh, instead of seeing you know, two weeks or four weeks later that this person forgot to read a disclosure, that right there in the moment, the, the agent sees, oh, you have to do this disclosure, otherwise you're going to have a, an issue. Or the manager right there in the moment sees, hey, you're eight minutes in, but the disclosure hasn't been read. You need to go back and do this. Um, those are the sort of things that AI and Balto 
uh, enable that previously were not possible. And I think will lead to a really awesome cultural shift in QA being a positive force for the contact center uh, more than they already are. That's awesome. And one of the things that I wanted to ask around the product and understanding its implementation within the organization, is this only the agent and the customer or does this also happen between the agent and the supervisor and the conversations they have with one another from coaching or otherwise? Yeah. So uh, the answer to that, Christian, is um, this summer it will be both. Um, and that's actually a really awesome product release that you know we have coming out that I shouldn't speak too much about, otherwise my PR partner will kill me. <laughs> um, but uh, this summer, it's going to be a really cool release that's going to uh, bring the manager into that loop and give them capabilities they've never had before. Yeah, I think it's the next logical place if I was in your shoes, and it obviously sounds like you're way ahead of it, so that's kind of awesome to think about. I know when we talk about fundamental changes in this space, these moments where things shift, and obviously the catalyst for a lot of people was the pandemic, and then you start to see the adoption of a lot of technologies. But from your seat, Mark, when you sit back and you go, okay, I know the contact center space well enough to say, if these are some things I could change or things that I'd want to see implemented, what would be like the biggest thing or things that come to mind and say, this, this would really change how contact centers deliver service and maybe even where people want to work instead of unfortunately being a place where there's a lot of turnover. Yeah. Um, it is going to be a cultural change that elevates the status of the agent and has the agent and the manager working together as peers. Um, the manager's skill set and the agent's skill set are different skill sets. What does the manager need to do? The manager needs to be able to enable a team, enable multiple people to all be as successful as possible. That's one skill. What does the agent need to be able to do? Have like high intensity conversations with customers all day with make or break moments that they need to consistently deliver on two very different skills, both very hard, both very valuable. How can we make sure that the status of the agent isn't the grunt who's doing the tough work and you got to you know, whip them into shape in, in order to have them deliver a good call? How do we make sure that's not the case? And I think that the contact center space has actually over the last couple of years done a really good job um, you know, humanizing uh, the agent role and remembering that it's a complete individual, not just uh, a seat. Um, you know, I, I, I would love to root out the term butts and seats. I think that, uh, you know, it's more than that. <laughs> they're, they're people who are uh, your front line talking to the customers. Um, so I think that that cultural change is going to be really, really important and is going to be something that it's going to change how the contact center works. And uh, it's also going to allow contact centers to keep these tenured agents and these top performers um, by by sourcing um, by sourcing their knowledge and making making their ideas part of the business. So I, I would almost challenge companies and say, um, what do you think are some of the things that your agents know that nobody else in the company knows? Like list those out. What are some some of the things and specific ways customers respond to specific uh, questions and value propositions and product mentions and competitor mentions and features and problems. Um, and, and if you say this, then, then that gets the customer excited. But if you say this, then that gets the customer frustrated. They've developed these mental models and they use them all day and make the model stronger and stronger and stronger. But no one else in the company has it. Can we make your contact center workforce the brain power of your organization where they are powering uh, the way that your broader organization communicates with your customers? That's part of the cultural change. That's part of elevating agent status. And I think that we're going to start to see um, that much more balanced hierarchy where agents and managers are working together to have excellent conversations rather than the, the top-down dynamic, which uh, was you know, very common uh, a decade ago or more. Yeah, and I think when you, what was really powerful about what you said about having every individual performer becoming the brain of the outcomes, right? Because everyone independently is having their own silos of 
of improvement or um, performance issues, right? And so we tend to focus on, here's the overall KPIs. They're not always individually looked at from a positive. It's just the outcome instead of what got you that outcome on every individual interaction. But then we focus on all the things that go bad, right? Because we want to root out the stuff that went bad, focus on the things that need to be improved. But if you see people that are superstars, right? And they're doing stuff that's really well, how do you share that with everybody else, right? And in a realistic manner. So I I use a term a lot that a lot of people use is cross pollinating, right? You're basically taking what works here and you're sharing it very quickly so that everything else can improve and grow off of that, right? And without cross pollinization, you know, things just don't grow. They don't, you know, share what's needed for what they need to get to that next level, right? And so in this scenario, it almost seems to be an enabler of that, which is great. We're getting towards the end of the slot, and obviously we want to make sure we get to some stuff that's personal, right? Because I also understand that you're a host of your own podcast, which is awesome, and you're in a similar number of episodes. How did you even come to be having a podcast? And then separately, for those who don't know, Reimagining the Contact Center is your podcast. Um, We'd love to understand, you know, do you have a favorite guest or something that was really outstanding that came out of one of your episodes? Yeah, so I think... uh... You know, how did it come to be? I think that the idea was um, that the leaders of the contact center space um, used to have this awesome public speaking platform. And, you know, they would uh, go around the country and do all these events. And during a period of time where um, their leadership and their influence and their thoughts are maximally important, COVID, right, where the industry is going through this ginormous transformation, it was hardest for their, for these leaders to get their thoughts out there. And I was thinking, um, you know, Balto and I have a perspective on, you know, where the contact center is going and, and, and how to handle all of this change. Um, but I'd like to talk to somebody who also has a perspective and Hey, may have been doing it for my entire lifetime. Um, and then when you talk to one person and you record that, and you say, oh, wow, that was a great conversation. I learned a lot. Then it makes you want to talk to another and another. So we actually started out by I just emailed you know, five uh, folks who had really interesting perspectives on the contact center that um, I respected. And I said, hey, I just want to talk to you for an hour and kind of ask uh, you know, what you think about everything that's going on. So it turns out that after you do that a number of times, you start to develop uh, like a philosophy. You start to notice patterns in what people are saying and different trends, and those trends are reiterated by a bunch of experts. So one of the ones that that keeps coming out again and again and again is the transition of the contact center from a cost center to a profit center and the importance of what happens when your agents are now touching the customer revenue. It's not a quick billing question normally because those are very easily handled with uh, virtual assistants and chatbots and that sort of thing. You know, what happens when uh, it, the, a customer's lifetime value is right there on the line in that call and maybe they're recurring or their subscription. And, uh, you know, if, it, if that interaction goes well, you, you know, have them for years. And if it doesn't, then they leave and go to a competitor. Um, so th- those sort of trends are things that we were able to pull out um, on the podcast. So I started it because I, I wanted to see uh, what is everyone saying? What is everyone thinking when they can't be, um, you know, on these stages right now? And then, um, you know, I was able to develop my own perspective as well. So it, it almost took on a new life where it's like, man, now I have stuff to share. I have thoughts and perspectives on this. And I'll, I'll say that the, the podcast actually is one of the best vehicles for me to develop that perspective. Yeah, I could say that a lot of what you're sharing mirrored some of my experiences in hosting our podcast and even our webinar. So was there anyone in particular that comes to mind that you think would be a great guest for our podcast that you've interviewed or had on your podcast? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a, a few I'm thinking of. Um, um, I'll start with, um, I think, um, Eduardo Nofuentes, um, and he started um, the Agile Contact Center. I think they actually have a podcast too. Um, and he was talking about, you know, what does it look like to bring agile, which, um, you know, most folks are used to in the tech sense, the engineering sense of like this very quick and iterative process. What does it look like to take agile from technology to the contact center? How do you give people maximum freedom to 
uh, make a lot of changes to their role very, very quickly. So your contact center isn't static, something that you set up and hope it doesn't degrade over the course of the year, but instead it's something iterative that gets better and better and better over time. Uh, so I love that co- that uh, podcast. I loved uh, Mario Bador uh, of StarTech, uh, and he was talking a lot about you know they have uh, something like forty thousand agents across the globe. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you manage that operationally, and also how do you manage that culturally? I thought that was a really interesting one. Um, whole bunch of, of of great speakers on that. So it's tough to choose favorites, but those kind of jumped out to me. That's awesome. And to really cap it off, I think one of the really neat things for your business is that you were named Gartner's cool vendor in the CRM customer service and support space. How do you feel about that? I mean, that's kind of a really neat experience to have. Elated. And not only elated just because it's cool to have Gartner mention us. Thank you, Gartner. (laughs) Um, But they mentioned our space. They mentioned that all in the report, they're talking about real-time guidance. And uh, I'm able to you know, tell folks, oh, real-time guidance, interesting. Go to realtimeguidance.com and see uh, who owns that. You know, like, like to see that our concept, our technology, our, you know, what we've built, get that level of recognition as a space, as a category, that was something that was really, really special. So it was great to be named as a company. We're very thrilled about that. But it's also great that now the analysts and the market and uh, even you know competitors, you know everyone is kind of aligning and seeing uh, you know the writing on the wall, or I guess the positive writing on the wall because it's usually a negative term that says like this idea of helping agents right there in the moments they need it. This idea is here to stay, and that was probably the best part about it. Yeah, I think it really concretely puts uh, an asterisk next to that term that it's something that's now part of the industry versus just a side idea or a thing that hasn't really come to fruition. So people embracing it like that is really cool. So Mark, we've ran out of time. Thanks so much for coming. Obviously it's been awesome having you. Now we definitely want people to be able to find you if they want to follow up with you. So where can they connect with you? Where they can they get a hold of you? Uh, you can find Balto at Balto, B-A-L-T-O dot A-I. You can find me at linkedin.com slash in slash Balto CEO. Um, and you can find our podcast, uh, Reimagining the Contact Center, on Apple Podcasts. And uh, I think we're on Spotify and uh, maybe one other. Awesome. Well, to all of our audience and everyone who's going to be joining now because of wanting to know more about Balto, go ahead and subscribe, listen, follow, connect with Mark and his team. Again, thanks so much for having um, having you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Uh, obviously, for everybody else, we'll catch you on the next episode. Real pleasure, Christian. Thank you.